Our next and last speaker is a tireless food and nutrition advocate. I met David virtually more than 12 years ago as a journalist. I was a journalist, Evan Salam. He's my go-to source for anything I need nutrition. He's always available seven days a week. And not only that, but he has five children and, and, and a loving wife. <laughs> so he's a busy guy. Um, I won't bore you with his long and prestigious bio as a physician, healthy food advocate, more than 200 research papers, 15 books, uh, and the list goes on, including the five children, which I'll repeat again because they deserve it. Um, I want to welcome to Hunter College, the New York City Food Policy Center, uh, and here in East Harlem, Dr. David Katz. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Audience good? Pleasure to be with you. I, good? Good. Enjoyed the panel very much. I, I regret that I didn't catch more of the day, but my impression is, based on the particulars, the practicalities, the intimacy of the panel's suggestions, that you've gotten excellent bits of practical advice and information throughout the day. And I stand between you and freedom. <laughs> and my mission in the next 20 minutes is to attempt to string the pearls, to assemble those bits into a cogent whole. And I brought along some help. It was six men of Indistan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second, feeling of the tusk, cried, Ho, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp, to me tis mighty clear, this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out an eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said he in the blindest man, can tell what this resembles most, deny the fact who can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth, no sooner had begun about the beast to grope, than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope, I see, quoth he, the elephant, is very like a rope. And so these men of Indistan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. <laughs> so often theologic wars, the disputants I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, and prate about the elephant not one of them has seen. My friends, I fear we're prone to much the same tendency in epidemiology, mm -hmm. nutritional epidemiology in particular. Present company excluded, of course. <laughs> so again, my mission in the next 20 minutes is to point out the elephant in the room past <laughs> the disassembled parts. On the other hand, before I do that, I do want to make an allowance for one of the salient trends in modern nutrition, which is in fact an up close and very intimate, very personal view of the parts. Personalizing diets, there is a case to make for that. So for instance, we have studies like the work of my friend Christopher Gardner at Stanford that compare different diets and look at outcomes that matter to people, like change in biomarkers and change in weight. But what Christopher has found in his research, and the same is true of Michael Danzinger at Tufts, is that there's no real difference. You compare Atkins and Ornish and pick any diet you like, and everybody loses weight in the beginning, and the longer you go, the more likely it is that everybody starts to gain it back, and the differences are small, and relatively inconsequential. However, 
If instead you look at the bell curve distribution for each diet, what you find is that on any given dietary assignment, some people do very well, some people do very poorly, and most people are somewhere in the middle. And the question then becomes, why did some people on, say, the Ornish diet do so well and others do so poorly, and might we find an answer in genetic polymorphisms? Might there be biomarkers that can predict who will respond optimally to any given diet? That's the work of Christopher Gardner at Stanford, and he's not alone. So is there opportunity to personalize in the realm of nutrigenomics? Absolutely. And then there's work like this very interesting study in Cell, which looked at glycemic responses to individual foods based on variations in the microbiome, and actually found marked differences in the postprandial glucose response curve based on microbiomic variation when people were given the exact same foods in the exact same doses. So is there an argument for microbiomic customization? Absolutely. There is a role for personalizing diets. And that then raises the question that we encounter each time we take out a dollar bill. Is it about the many or is it about the one? E pluribus unum. Out of many, one. In any group of elephants, there is genetic variation. Alas, there are too few groups of elephants in the world these days. Elephants are under severe pressure, and that's a concern, but a topic, I suppose, for another day. But when there were many more elements, we may surmise reasonably that there was genetic variation among them as there is among us. And yet, we tend to think, yeah, but they're all elephants and presumably should all eat whatever it is that elephants eat. In other words, it's fairly obvious looking at this other species that the commonality of species to some extent is predominant over inter-individual variation. Well, perhaps much the same is true of us. We have remarkable diversity. Frankly, you see it in this room just as readily as you see it in this picture. But on the other hand, we are all homo sapiens. And although we have diverged and covered the globe in the modern era, throughout most of our history, we were small, clustered, isolated tribes with common ancestry. We're all cousins. Some of us very close cousins, some of us more distant. But we're all part of the same great big human family. So some might argue this is the elephant in the room, the woolly mammoth, and maybe that's an argument for Paleolithic nutrition. Trouble is, Dorothy, we're not in the Stone Age anymore, and nobody can eat mammoth these days, just try to find one. But there's another message here, the message that is relevant to every other species too. The common adaptation at the level of species to sustenance. We're all homo sapiens. We are all closely related. And so at the end of this reflection on the parts, I think the case can be made that both the many and the one matter. One species, many individuals. There is, I think, a fundamental, compellingly clear theme of optimal nutrition for our kind. And I think there is the opportunity to customize for individuals. But that's the icing. The well-baked cake is the theme that's common to us all, and I'll devote the rest of my talk to that. So I think this little girl can have her genomically and microbiomically customized watermelon and eat a healthy diet, too. And I think much the same is true for all of us. So it's about both the many and the one. What modern science has told us about the fundamentals of good nutrition is every bit as clear and compelling as the story we get from evolutionary biology. For decades, we can go back at least to 1993 with a seminal paper in JAMA entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. So for decades, we have known that the master levers of medical destiny, the things that most influence the likelihood of years in life and the quality of life in those years, are lifestyle behaviors. 
In that paper in 1993, 10 factors that accounted for virtually all of the premature deaths in the United States every year were enumerated. But the first three, all by themselves, accounted for 80%, 80% of the premature deaths in our country annually. And those three were tobacco, poor diet, lack of physical activity, or as I routinely refer to them for ease of memory, if nothing else, bad use of feet, forks, and fingers. 80% of the premature deaths in our country, and those premature deaths followed chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, lung diseases. So we're talking about the things that siphon away both years from life and life from years, bad use of feet, forks, and fingers. That theme has been a repetitive drumbeat in the peer-reviewed literature ever since. You can find the papers that tell you these are the factors that most compromise the human condition in modern epidemiology, and you can find the papers that tell you if you flip this around, if you don't smoke, if you eat optimally, if you're physically active, and oh, by the way, if you also get enough sleep, are not wildly stressed out, and have love and purpose in your life, feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love, you get all six of those right, you're in a blue zone. You're likely to live to be 100. You'll probably never get a chronic disease. And one night at 102, you'll go to sleep and just not wake up. You will live long. You will prosper with vitality. And you will go gentle into that good night in the fullness of time. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished. The master levers of medical destiny are nothing at the cutting edge of technological advance. They are not the latest app. The master levers of medical destiny were in your hands all along. They're what you manage to do every day with your feet, your fork, and your fingers. And of course, we know what Archimedes said about a lever, give me one long enough, I can move the whole world. Make no mistake, these few levers are long enough and should long since have served to move the whole world of modern epidemiology and public health to a better place. But, alas, to apply a lever well, you need to know where to put it. And sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. With regard to fingers, smoking is bad, not smoking is better. Any confusion in the room? <laughs> One lever, well placed. With regard to feet, moving around is good, staying on our backsides all day long, not so much. Any confusion in the room? Another lever, well placed. Ah, but then there are forks. <laughs> Where exactly do you stick the forks? <laughs> and here, everybody's got an opinion. <laughs> and most people who come along with an opinion tell us that everybody else who came along up until last week with an opinion is a moron. Don't <laughs> listen to them. I'm the only one who knows. Those guys get thrown under the bus and around and around and around we go with mononutrient fixations, silly fads and fashions, and we go in circles. And what we're squandering as we do that is human potential. We are surrendering years from our lives, life from our years, the panel appropriately referred to children, the obligation we all have to cultivate the best possible destiny, including medical destiny for children, but we are compromising that medical destiny for our children by telling them, through the constant murmuring of our culture, America runs on Duncan. Multicolored marshmallows are part of a complete breakfast. I noticed that none of the panelists included those, but they're on TV all the time. Must be the right thing to do. And besides, don't worry about it. You can grow up, get fat and sick, and then go on the next great fad diet and reverse it all, right? Just join the club. Well, that's a tremendous mistake, and I think it leaves most of the people we interact with, the public, our patients, our clients, asking this question. What to trust about food? <laughs> Where did you think I was going with that? And it brings us, this is a family program, and it brings us to a fork in the road. Along one time, we remain forever befuddled about the basic care and feeding of homo sapiens, I would like to propose the alternative road less traveled into the future and say, no, we are not clueless 
about the basic care and feeding of Homo sapiens. And Charles, I appreciate the kind introduction. So this has been the front line of battle I've been engaged in now for the better part of three decades, trying to clarify the bird's eye view of all of this. And, and those battles have played out across the pages of books and articles and studies and so forth and interacting with, with people who are right there beside me and I appreciate that. So down at the bottom, I've written three editions of a nutrition textbook, Nutrition and Clinical Practice. The third came out in 2014, 750 pages, about 10,000 citations across that expanse. And I tell you this not to point out how abysmally painful it is to write a textbook, but by the way, it's abysmally painful to write a textbook. <laughs> Don't ever do it, okay? Fellow academics in the room who've written textbooks, horrible, right? Okay, anyway, you haven't done it, never sign up for it, it's a horrible gig. But in any event, it's the obligatory view from altitude. And then on a much smaller scale, papers like the one at the top, which was commissioned by Annual Review of Public Health a couple years ago, Can We Say What Diet is Best for Health? That's available, by the way, freely online, so feel free to help yourselves to that. But I'm not alone. In fact, I'm working side by side with some of the best in the business. So many others are really looking from out to who. Uh, Darius Mozafarian, Dean of Nutrition at Tufts, has written very thoughtfully about the fundamentals of a health-promoting diet. Uh, Jim Mann at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And the third bullet here, the senior author, is Frank Hugh, who has now taken over from Walter Willett as chair of nutrition at Harvard. And Frank's paper, Prevention and Management of Type 2 Diabetes, Dietary Components, etc., came out in The Lancet almost exactly at the time my paper came out in the Annual Review of Public Health. I read Frank's paper, Frank read mine, probably only because I asked him to, but in any event, we concluded pretty much exactly the same thing. I could have written his conclusion, he could have written mine, and we did not work together. So he said, that's remarkable, let's tell the world. So we got together and wrote a piece for the Huffington Post, which has the same title as my talk this afternoon, Knowing What to Eat, Refusing to Swallow It, which is something we have been doing in our culture for decades. If you look with a willful suppression of bias at arguments for or against low-fat diets and vegan diets and low-glycemic diets and the DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension, or the diet used in the DPP, the Diabetes Prevention Program, or paleo diets or low-carb diets or the Mediterranean diet, what you hear about every day on the morning shows but as of today, not from Matt Lauer. <laughs> but the folks who remain on the morning shows is why my diet can beat your diet. That's all we ever hear about. What we tend never to hear about is actually any diet with a legitimate claim of being a good diet has in common the most important stuff with every other diet that has the same legitimate claim, the olive in the middle, very nicely skewered by Michael Pollan, whose name was mentioned a little while ago, when he said, eat food, meaning real food, recognizable as food, not too much, mostly plants. Beautiful seven words. And admittedly, it's a little vague, leaves a lot to the imagination, but frankly, as someone who's devoted an entire academic career to this, I'm okay with that. What it means is you get to be the boss of your own diet, and who else ought to be? There is a fundamental theme of healthy eating for Homo sapiens, and by the way, that theme is mostly eat vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds, and when you're thirsty, drink plain water, preferably not in plastic from a place in California that's parched. <laughs> and whatever else you do, it's probably going to be okay. And you heard a lot of really interesting and, and interrelated advice from the panelists, and I'm sure you've been getting it throughout the day, but that is the beating heart. That is the fundamental theme, and you get to choose. You can be pescatarian, you can be Mediterranean, you can be vegan. You can even do low carb, but if you do that, I'd recommend the diet that was studied and published by David Jenkins at the University of uh, Toronto, the Eco Atkins diet, which is a low carb, high protein, plant exclusive diet. So you're getting a lot of that protein from beans and, and legumes, so that can work too. And paleo, that's fine. Although, let's admit, very few people, anybody doing paleo? Do you eat 100 grams of fiber a day? I know you don't because you wouldn't be in the room now. You'd be in the bathroom. 
right? So, you know, we sort of play fast and loose with the paleo concept. So the real experts in paleo tell us those guys, you know, I mean, they were wandering around all day. They ate a wide variety of wild plants that are all extinct. They ate a wide variety of wild animals that are all extinct, and they got 100 grams of fiber a day, right? So it's fine to do some modern variant on that, but it's not fine to eat bacon and pastrami and wave the paleo banner. There was no paleolithic pastrami. Right? So you want to, you know, hunt game and eat a wide variety of wild plants? Okay, fine. But, you know, again, most people aren't doing that quite right. But in any event, lots of choices, but all variations on the same theme, which, by the way, is a radical departure from the way most people in modern culture, certainly ours, actually eat. And much the same conclusion was reached in the 572-page report of the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. And, and this, the 2015 report was excellent. The 2015 dietary guidelines, not so much. So this is what the scientists think the science says people ought to eat. The actual dietary guidelines for Americans are what politicians think people ought to be told about what the scientists actually think the science actually says. Ignore the dietary guidelines for Americans. It is watered down, mealy mouth, political gobbledygook. And go directly to this excellent report, which is available online. We reached much the same conclusion a couple of years ago when I was privileged to co-chair a conference in Boston with Walter Willett, sponsored by Old Ways and called Common Ground. We brought together diverse experts from all around the world, and our job was to try and figure out, do we in fact have common ground about diet? And I'll tell you the conclusion shortly, but basically we agreed with pollens eating too much, mostly plants, and the list of specific items I just mentioned. And really all we're left with when we're trying to be confused is pseudo-controversy. So we get papers on nutrition controversies like this very prominent paper in Jack. But when the controversy is resolved, what have we learned? We have learned that olives and olive oil, good for us. Okay, that doesn't seem all that surprising. Uh, berries and fruit, good for us. Okay, not exactly shocking there. Um, nuts, good for us. Okay, I think I've heard that elsewhere. Green leafy vegetables, good for us. And more plant-based proteins from beans and legumes, good for us. So where exactly were the controversies? We had pseudo-controversies, resolved them by finding out that everything most of us actually knew to be true was in fact actually true. But what a colossal waste of time and effort to have to keep addressing this over and over again. And the key components of a healthy diet have been enumerated many times, and they're just what you'd expect. So Darius Mozafarian, who often raises controversial positions about diet, but ultimately I think gets it right, oversaw this massive study looking at all of the deaths in the United States in 2012, that was the reference year, and dietary components associated with them. And the conclusions were we'd be better off and less likely to die before we really want to if we ate less highly processed foods in particular processed meats, were, which are concentrated sources of sodium, among other things. We ate less fast food, we drank less soda, we ate more nuts and seeds, we ate more vegetables, we ate more fruits, we ate fish and seafood in the place of other meats. Is there a, a, an epiphany on that list for anybody here? <laughs> That's the epiphany. There is no epiphany. The truth about diet for health is simple. It's the damn lies that are complicated. And by the way, the notion that Mark Hyman personally discovered the harms of excess sugar in his garage last Wednesday, um, and that's one of the popular, or Gary Taubes discovered it, somebody discovered there's a massive conspiracy, nobody but me, just me, is willing to tell you that it's not all about saturated fat, but sugar is bad for you too. I'm the only one willing to tell you that. And there are a lot of people who are telling you they're the only one willing to tell you that. Well, they're wrong. There have only been dietary guidelines for Americans since 1980. We've had 40 years of dietary guidelines. These are the first. 1980, there were seven takeaways. Number five, don't eat too much sugar. We've been telling people this for 40 years. It's just nobody's paying attention. So if anybody discovered this in their garage last Wednesday, they rediscovered it. And yes, we can tell people again, but they've heard it before. And by the way, the idea that we cut fat and got fatter and sicker is another load of hooey. This is America. We don't cut stuff. If you want to reduce the percent of calories you get from fat in America, you don't cut fat. You just increase calories and dilute it down as a percent of the total, right? There are two ways to shrink a ratio. You can actually shrink the numerator. That stinks. Or you can grow the denominator. We grew the denominator. The dietary intake trends in the United States show we've been eating more fat, not less. We've just been eating so much more carbs 
that the percent of calories from fat went down a very little bit. So we're eating more fat, but even more, more carbs. How come we're not all thin and healthy now? What the hell could possibly have gone wrong? Boy, it's very confusing. And if you actually want to see the flow of dietary trends over the past 40 years, Google Vox America Dietary Changes. It'll land you on this page, and it's a dynamic flow diagram, and it looks at dietary change over the past four decades. It's extremely cool, and it will reaffirm what I just told you. Okay, so you can try to capture this URL, but don't. Or take a picture. That's right, everybody's got cameras. Go ahead, take a picture. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm living in the Stone Age. Take a picture, okay. But if you just Google, if you don't have a camera with you, Google Vox America Diet Change, you'll find it. Um, and by the way, we even know why we're eating more than ever before. And we've had this memo before, but we beautifully received it from Michael Moss, a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist who wrote the book Salt, Sugar, Fat. Uh, has another book due out imminently called Hooked. But he wrote this New York Times Magazine cover story as well, excerpted from his book, The Extraordinary Science of Addictive Junk Food. And in it, he describes the machinations of every big food company which hires teams of PhDs, gives them functional MRI machines and marching orders to design food people cannot stop eating. And they get their bonus check only when they succeed. And then we tell every soccer mom, eat well, not too much, mostly plants. Good luck with that, right? And we, we basically produce the dietary minefield and expect people to tiptoe through it successfully somehow. Okay, so what is the truth about diet and health? We are constitutionally omnivorous. We do have the omnivorous dilemma, but basically what being omnivorous means is that we have choices. I have a horse, I'm an equestrian, and I like to point out to people who think that you have to eat meat to make muscle. The troubadour is 1,300 pounds of exquisite muscle who can run for three hours over hill and dale with me on his back and jump over fences. And he eats grass and oats and hay, and there is that miraculous alchemy of turning grass and oats and hay into beautiful, elegant horse muscle. But he's an herbivore. Lions can't do that. Lions are carnivores. They also produce magnificent muscle. They've got to do it from meat. We are omnivores. We have choices to make. What are the right choices? Well, we have choices for fat, and it's pretty clear. Massive study out of Harvard <coughs> looking at, I think, three and a half million years of person observation, or person years of observation. Um, and they basically found that the higher the percentage of calories from saturated fat, the higher the rate of premature death from all causes, the higher the percentage of calories from unsaturated fat from nuts, seeds, olives, avocado, fish, and seafood, the lower the rate of premature death from all causes. This is the truth. This is the truth based on the best data sets we have, and yet we wind up here. <laughs> How is it we wind up here? Well, because mostly our culture deals in dietary nonsense. The truth is simple, the lies are complicated, and it's the lies that are most effectively promulgated all the time. Everybody telling you that saturated fat is good for you now, whether they know it or not, is basing the argument on two meta-analyses, one from 2010, one from 2014. Here they are, and here's what they both found. Across a fairly narrow range of saturated fat intake at the level of the population, rates of heart disease were high and constant. <coughs> Therefore, saturated fat is good for you now. Does that follow logically? Can anyone explain that to me? No, doesn't mean that at all. Across a narrow range of saturated fat intake, high, low, same high rates of heart disease. You know what that means? It means there's more than one way to eat badly, and we, the American people, are committed to exploring them all. When we eat a bit less saturated fat, we are not replacing it with kale and lentils. We're replacing it with low-fat junk food. Neither of these meta-analyses looked at this issue, but this study by Lee and colleagues at Harvard did. They asked what happens when people reduce their saturated fat intake based on what they replace those calories with, Here's what they found. Reduce saturated fat calories, replace them with trans fat calories, it, like stop eating butter and eat stick margin, bad idea. Rates of heart disease go from bad to worse. Take out saturated fat calories, replace them with refined carbohydrate and added sugar. So stop eating cheese omelets but have donuts for breakfast every day, bad idea. Rates of heart disease remain constant. There is more than one way to eat badly. but. Replace saturated fat calories with unsaturated fat calories, nuts, seeds, olive, avocado, fish, seafood, rates of heart disease plummet. Replace saturated fat calories with calories from whole grains, rates of heart disease plummet. 
Once again, there is no controversy. Most of what we hear in pop culture is just somebody's attempt to sell you something and relatively little of it is true. The truth about diet and health is really very simple. We have choices for dietary protein, another big cohort study out of Harvard. Same basic notion here. The higher the percent of calories from animal protein, the higher the rates of premature death from all causes. Is it the animal protein per se, as T. Colin Campbell, author of the Chinese study, would have it? I don't know. Maybe it's the company that animal protein keeps with saturated fat. Maybe it's the toxins that are bioaccumulated in animals. Or maybe people eating more meat are eating less vegetables, and it's the harm of what they aren't eating. I don't know. Who cares? What we know is if you eat a lot of animal foods, you're more likely to die prematurely. The higher the percent of calories you get from plant protein, the lower the rate of premature death from all causes. Beans over beef. And here's a study that looks directly at that issue from 2010, also from Harvard, looking at single food substitutions. And if you just scan the, the midline is unity, to the right is increased risk, to the left is decreased risk. Just look at the bottom one, beans for red meat. Largest single reduction in the rate of coronary disease. This was, happened to be for a study of women, but there's no reason to think it's any different for men. And we've had some reference in, in the panel, I presume, throughout the day to environmental issues. We have choices for water preservation. Just so happens that beef is off the charts yep. with regard to using water to produce a certain quantity of food compared to any plant food. We have choices for the climate. I love this article in the conversation. Meat may be a complex health issue. It's a simple environmental one. Eight billion hungry homo sapiens around the world need to eat less of it, period, end of story. And frankly, folks, I'm a public health person, but I need a planet. So I've become an environmental health person too because there is no public health without a hospitable planet to call your own. It's all one thing. Thank you. And we have choices for biodiversity, and what we eat obviously has the potential to decimate other species, either because we wipe out their habitats to raise cattle, so we're doing that in the Amazon, we're doing that in Borneo where we're cutting down native rainforests to make room for palm oil plantations so we can make processed food, or we just eat the wild animals directly. But one way or another, we are the source of the sixth great mass extinction event in the history of our planet, and frankly, I do not want to be the guy who eats some damn thing with palm oil in it that was the reason the last tree an orangutan might have climbed in Borneo was cut down. These things must figure in the choices of decent, responsible people who have the misfortune of living now. We didn't choose this. We could have been born at a time where there weren't 8 billion hungry homo sapiens in the world, but here we are. It is our task to take care of what has been bequeathed to us, in order that we bequeath something viable to those who follow. We have choices, and yet, for decades, the typical American diet has bogged down here, changing almost not at all. So, to wrap up, we know what food is the best medicine. But damn it, we can't get that medicine to go down. And Lord knows the last thing we need is more spoons full of sugar, but I would argue we need some kind of spoon to get the medicine to go down, and it doesn't look like this. <laughs> this is the reason why, over the span of my career, we've had ever more obesity, ever more chronic disease. It isn't for want of goodwill people, thoughtful, intelligent, knowledgeable people like those in this room. But we are the minority. America runs on Duncan. Multicolored marshmallows are part of every six-year-old's complete breakfast. Just ask Madison Avenue. So the good guys are bailing with pipettes, the bad guys are flooding the boat we're all in, and it's sinking with a fire hose. And if you think I'm kidding, I mean this pretty literally. These are new kid cereals introduced in 2017, even as we gather to fuss and fret about food insecurity and epidemic type 2 diabetes. Do you think anybody's going to get better? because now we've got sprinkled donut crunch as a oh. breakfast choice. I will note that none of the panelists talking about breakfast mentioned sprinkled donut crunch. Obviously, it's a blind spot in their dietary portfolios. <laughs> I think the solution looks a bit more like this. We got to the moon for three reasons. We wanted to go, we're an ingenious species, and we knew where to find the damn thing. I think we could get to a world with 80% less premature death and chronic disease where we can feed the hungry and those who don't face food insecurity eat food, not too much, mostly plants as a matter of routine, but only if we agree we want to go. 
We apply our ingenuity and we acknowledge we know where there is. Our culture must stop going around in circles, wasting time because it is costing lives. So the big spoon is culture. We have evidence of the effect of this big spoon, not just from Minneapolis, but from the world's blue zones where people apply this formula, routinely live to be 100 years old and don't get chronic disease. The Bolivian Amazon where the Chimani do much the same. And frankly, we even have evidence that blue zones can be turned into blueprints and transplanted. Half a century ago in North Karelia, Finland, they took the teachings of Ansel Keys, shifted from animal food-centric diets to more plant food-centric diets, and rates of heart disease plummeted over 80%, and average life expectancy increased by more than 10 years over the course of that half century. The trouble we have is being heard above the din. It is not want of truth that forestalls our progress. It is want of unity. So I think we can take a page from the playbook of our illustrious colleague, Dr. Seuss, who wrote up the case study of a pachyderm with either extraordinary auditory acuity or uncompensated schizophrenia. It's always been a little hard to know which. And pull our voices to elevate the truth above the noisy nonsense. And I've devoted much of this stage of my career to that enterprise. I want to build bridges. I want to stand together with colleagues as diverse as leading advocates of vegan diets and leading advocates of paleo diets who say none of us eats anything that looks like the typical American diet. In fact, we eat much like one another. The vegan plate, mixed greens, lentils is a protein source. The paleo diet, the plate, same mixed greens, wild salmon in the place of the lentils, or maybe bison but more alike than different, nothing that glows in the dark, no multicolored marshmallows anywhere in sight, and nobody's drinking soda, we all agree. And I invite you to check out the True Health Initiative, which is my 501c3 devoted to this global coalition of voices. We're 400 council members strong from 40 countries across the expanse from vegan to paleo saying, we agree about the fundamentals of a health-promoting diet, and everybody deserves to know what those are. And it brings us back to a final fork in the road. For far too long at the level of our culture, we have let health languish along the road less traveled. Together, and frankly only together, only with the strength of unity, only by pulling together and pooling our voices can we elevate the truth and at long last put the truth on a path of lesser resistance. And if we do that, the elephant in the room could look like this. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, David.